We are recording. Good evening. It is January 30th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. And uh, there is no other actual in-person attendance, um, but we will make every effort to ensure that the public can adequ adequately access the proceeding in real time via technological means. So we, um, oh, there is Councillor Ette. Good, I'm gonna take a roll call and just make sure everyone can be heard and hear. I'll start with Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Councillor DeAngelis. You're muted. Present, sorry. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tao. Here. And Pam Rennie's here. Topic, it is action item 4A. It is, we need to discuss ZBA vacancies. And in particular, we have sufficiency of pool. We have options to proceed, review of interview questions, selection criteria, and interview dates. I'm going to state for the people that are in the audience, uh, action item 4B is the discussion about rental bylaws, and we will get through the CBA conversation as quickly as we can, but it was on the agenda first. Thank you. So, um, Looking to to the um, CRC members. In your packet was a short report on the status of community activity forms, and uh, also sort of a statement of the immediate ZBA needs. Uh, at the moment, there was one resignation, so there is a full member's position due uh, to the resignation, and that is for about a year and a half, uh, ending June. 2025. There is still an associate one-year position of which there are about five months, six months left of that term um, through the end of June 2024. There are, um, coming up in July, there is one full member position and again the four associate members that normally get assigned each year at the moment, we have two current associate members. We have a current full member who uh, is interested in the 2025 position and three new um, community activity forms. Two of those people have expressed interest in other um, town committees. Any, anyone want to take a bit of a conversation about um, just the status of that? I'm going to have trouble move, seeing hands, so I'm going to move this down. Uh, Mandy Jo. Given the trouble, <clears throat> sorry, that we had trying to find applicants in November and December for these positions, that we couldn't declare the pool sufficient. And given right now that it's the end of January and it generally takes six to eight weeks to complete the process. I think it would be wise for us to amend the bulletin board notice to include notice of the impending vacancies for the terms that um, have, uh, expire on June 30th of this year. So the, the terms beginning July 1, um, the one full member that's expiring June 30th, and then the four associate members that expire every year, so that we can potentially go through the process once and appoint um, residents to fulfill, fill out the current, well, recommend appointing residents to fill out the current five or four, or however many months remain when we finish the process, and then also recommend to the council appointments for the next year. It seems odd 
to just do the one full member, the one associate member now and immediately start the process over for July. So I would recommend modifying the bulletin board notice, waiting two weeks. I know, you, I, I believe because of what I've seen that you've notified the current associates and the full member for those whose terms are expiring about a CAF, but it would be good to not modify the bulletin board notice, I think, um, so that other people that might be following this recognize we're looking to fill not just the next five months or four months that, that the term would be a year and see if we get anything, any additional applicants. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to clarify. So we would now start posting so that we would not be repeating this again in, okay, and, and we can do that. I mean, there's like nothing in the charter that requires us. I mean, I think that's a great, if we can do that, that makes sense. Although I also have a question, but that would mean a delay in when we would fill the current vacancies. Can the ZBA wait that long? Yeah, good point. Um, Andy, do you have any advance too? So the charter requires all vacancies or impending vacancies to be up for two weeks. So if the bulletin board notice gets modified instead of a new one there, we could declare the pool sufficient for those five potentially at our next meeting or so. Um, I recommend modifying the bulletin board notice so that new CAFs don't need submitted by anyone because the notice is already up and we know the procedure requires that you only include as applicants those that file a CAF after the notice goes up. So to save us and them work, I think modifying that notice, which is possible, would be the most efficient way to do it. Um, we could still probably do a lot of the stuff and, mm -hmm. and look towards working on scheduling interviews in that intermediate time, even though the pool hasn't technically been declared sufficient yet. Any other comments on that? I That sounds like a very reasonable approach. Do um, Does anyone have wording that they want, or do you want me to just go work with Athena to include the additional positions that um, we would like added. Any wording? I'll work, oh, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to work with you. Okay. Do I have permission from the committee to work with Athena to modify the current posting that is in on the bulletin board to include not just the vacancy for one full member for the year and a half term, but also to include the vacancies for the four associate members and the one full member starting in July 1, 2025. Okay, I'm seeing nods. We'll do that. Thank you. Okay, while we are here and we're, we're on this topic, have people had an opportunity to look at the interview questions? Um, I put out a notice to, um, to the council and said, if you have any, if you have any uh, comments to add or subtract to our questions, our interview questions for the ZBA, I received none from anyone on the council. So I am assuming that they were good in the eyes of the council. Did any of you have any comments on the interview questions? Should we pull them up just to have them or is, I'm, I'm seeing a nod yes. I'm, I'm looking to Mandy to pull that up. All of all of these, just for new counselor, um, all of these items, all of these documents are in our packet in SharePoint so that um, if you have an opportunity to go through that, 
uh, they're all they should always be in there prior to the meeting itself. Most of us, again, are familiar with these questions. We used them last year. Um, do you consider them adequate and appropriate? Jennifer. I do. I think they served us well in our prior interviews. Anyone have modifications that they feel strongly need to be added? I'm seeing uh, Council Ete. No modifications. I think I had gone through them and some are tricky, but quite good. We are comfortable. Any other ones? I um, can we vote to adopt these uh, these interview questions for the coming season. I'll just call it season. I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you. All in, let's see, we'll go by, we'll go by head count here. Um, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Jennifer Tao. Yes. Councilor Ette. Aye. And Cam Rooney, aye. So it's unanimous, we will adopt, reuse, the questions, selection guidance. One more topic here. The criteria for a healthy and effective multi-member body. Again, we have um, the factors that the council felt were important for an effective body, and we had input from the body's chair. Uh, in response to my outreach to the committee uh, to the bot to the planning board uh, zoning board's chair excuse me uh, there was no change in the material the one suggestion was that in terms of um, some items to consider when making appointments and recommendations to the ZBA might include and we have a list geographic economic age employment length of residency diversity and then the last one, which is collegial, willing to listen not only to the views of the applicants and public, but also sensitive to the opinions and expertise of other members. He said probably the only thing he would do is swap those two around so they would be in a, just a different order. He felt that the, that the conditions and the criteria were still very valid and stood um, the board in good, in good stead when trying to make decisions. Thank you. Do I have a, do I have any kind of a motion to accept those changes and adopt uh, the selection guidance as it appears on the paper? So moved. Okay, second. Uh, second. Thank you. Uh, let's see. All in favor, we have, again, I'll just keep going through the same list. Uh, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Ette. Aye. Cam Rooney, aye. So it's unanimous. We made the changes. We will adopt those as our criteria. Um, thank you. I think that's it. Um, I think that's it on ZBA. So uh, let's see. And thank you for that. That was quick and efficient. We are now moving to action item 4B, which is general law bylaw 3.50, rental registration bylaw regulations and fee structure, discussion with landlords managers on rental permitting bylaw regulations and fees. And we will 
we'll begin by attempting a discussion on that topic. I have, uh, sorry, David, you have your hand up. Yeah, if, if depending on how you want to conduct this, Pam, I'm just hoping that um, Councillor Haneke could assist us uh, with, she's a little more nimble with the with the technology than I am. So if there's some help to be uh, had there, I would uh, hope that Mandy could help out there, depending on how you want to run this this part of the meeting. Thanks. Okay. Um, I have also asked Mandy Johanneke if she might be willing to uh, pull up documents if we needed to look at something, if someone is trying to reference what is in the, in the proposal. Um, so, Let's ask Mandy Johanneke how she feels about it. I am happy to do that. I actually raised my hand for another question since you had told that one previous speaker, 730. Right. I wondered if we wanted to adopt our calendar first to get us closer to 730 so that the only agenda item left is 4B and then we'll know exactly how long we have for it. Yep. It's up to That's you. Fine, I think we were, yeah, our great idea. So we have calendar, and we also have minutes, so we could do both of those and just get them done. So going to calendar, there was there was a little bit of discrepancy between the calendar that was proposed by the clerk, uh, Athena O'Keefe, and the one that I had taken a, a draft stab at. But it looks like if, um, I think it's in the packet. I think I did put this in the packet with kind of a marked up version with uh, red dates that were still different than what um, Athena had suggested. And we can adopt the ones that we feel are appropriate given your all calendars that we hadn't had a chance to um, consider. Andy, are you able to define that? Perfect. Is this the one you were asking for? One. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everything in dark letters is uh, as Athena O'Keefe had suggested in the in the total calendar. Uh, you still have your hand up, Mandy. You want to add something uh, else? You can go on. I have some questions about it, but I'm comparing. So give me a second. So uh, we get down to April 9, and I had originally suggested April 16, um, but I am I am willing my calendar was open as um, to April 30th and April 9 as the two April meetings. I think we had a conflict on the uh, on the 23rd, and um, so we don't want the 23rd. So. The thirtieth was was fine. It works for us. Any other questions about those two particular ones? So I'm going to suggest that we adopt the April nine and the April thirty. Uh, in July, there was not a date on the calendar um, of per um, Athena's list. Uh, and she suggested that rather than putting in something extra, that we would that it, that we not include something there. So I wanted to run that by the committee. Do we have a placeholder, or do we simply say there is not a meeting in July or early July? How do you all feel about that, Pat? Pat, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just like council meeting. I'm sorry. Um, I the suggested by Athena, I was interested in finding out the reason she was making those suggestions. Is it had something to do with staffing this or anything like that? Her suggestions were were based on the overall schedule of committee meetings and recognizing, you know, which members are on particular committees. And so she was trying to separate them out. No, I understand that, but I'm. She suggested this ninth, or she suggested the sixteenth. Um, she suggested the ninth, and then also the twenty fourth versus the seventeenth. 
So I'm trying to figure out what her reasoning is to see how I feel about it. Does that make okay. sense? I can answer some of that. Uh, 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 Mandy, go ahead. So the 23rd is, um, well, Athena set the CRC calendar to be the second and fourth Tuesday of every month with finance being the first and third Tuesday yeah. of every month. So, so that's how she said it. So that's why <clears throat> she had April nine um, instead of Pam, who was looking at the 16th to put them two weeks apart. She right. had April 23rd, but April 23rd is actually um, the first full day of Passover. So the second oh. evening of Passover. Um, so it might not be wise to hold a meeting that night. Um, and so moving to April 30th, given that I think there's four th Tuesdays in April anyway, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Athena skipped July, J July 9th. I was actually going to comment on that and say, I prefer having them in the calendar, um, and canceling if we could, but once we don't put it in the calendar, it's hard to add a meeting in when everyone's ignored that there might be a meeting there. So I would like to have July 9th listed yeah. or some second meeting in July. If we want it to be the 16th, I don't really care which one it is, but two meetings a month, I would like to have listed on the calendar, um, which that that's why I've got a lot of comments in November and December. Um, mm -hmm. But um two in a month is what I'd like. So something in July, I'm not partial to the 9th or the 16th. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, thank you. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, and again, I think Athena wanted um, her suggestion to not have meetings in July was because so staff would know there was a month they could take vacation. So I don't, but we could pencil it in. We could say if needed. Okay, let's move to the September then. Uh, September was suggested by by Athena, and the twenty fourth was suggested by the by Athena. I had I had earlier and later versions of that. Um, does anyone have any hard hard feelings about tenth or twenty fourth? And October eighth and twenty second. It's just one week later than what I had originally suggested. And then no November 26, which is two days before Thanksgiving. And um, we could, again, just say we don't hold that meeting. Mandy. So alternating with finance in November and December presents problems for CRC because then we end up with one meeting a month, um, which maybe we'll have a light schedule. We can always hope, right? Um, but I guess my suggestion would be to schedule them instead of two weeks in a row, like November 12 and 17 and December 10 and 17, to actually go on the same days as finance. So November 5 and 19 and December 3 and 17. Um, they still, it means we fully alternate instead of having three weeks, one week, three weeks, one week or something like that. Um, I think it makes for a schedule. I believe I'm the only counselor affected by having finance and CRC on the same day. Um, and I'm okay with that. Okay, so your suggestion is uh, November 5, November 19, and then continue with December 10, December 17? December 3 and December 17. Okay. All right, and then what about September? Anyone else have uh, thoughts on the September 10 and 24? 8 of October and 22nd of October. Those, should, those would stand. 
uh, and then back to April, just so I'm confirming. And we could just say if needed, if needed on that one. Any motion to adopt these um, dates for the calendar? So moved. Any second? Second, second Jennifer. Uh, let's see, all in favor, Haneke. Aye. DeAngelis. Aye. Tao. Aye. Ete. Aye. Rooney, aye. So we have adopted the calendar. That's great for 2024, and we will submit that to Athena so she knows our, our schedule. Um, be very quick here. So we have the last, last item before we go back over to re rental registration, and that is the, uh, the meeting minutes from our first meeting of the year, January 11, very short, very sweet. I'm gonna move that we adopt them as presented. Any second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. And let's see, Haneke. Aye. DeAngelis. Aye. How? Yes. Okay. Aye. Rooney, aye. Done. Okay, thank you. So now we're moving to action item 4B, general bylaw 3.50 rental registration, which I read previously. And I would like to see if there are folks in the audience. So we have we have Zoom. Zoom is not a very friendly character. And um, if there might be five or six people of Pats or you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to remind you, and you're probably already thinking of it, of um... The gentleman, Rich Gold, I believe his name was, who's coming at 7.30. He should be added into the list when he gets here. Thank you. So the, the way I have envisioned um, working through this material tonight, because there was there is a lot to think about and lots of comments that have been uh, received, that I had a bit of a structure that I was thinking would be... Um, sorry. <laughs> On my notes, I had a structure that I had written out at least to um, focus the conversation on different topics. And I would like to make it as easy to interact and ask questions of some of the participants, not only given what we just experienced earlier, but the fact that it's Oh, it, it's going to be very tough to go back and forth. What I'm thinking is that we might work through some of these topics and then hold another session of, um, of public comment or questions that could also be then responded to by staff or by CRC members. I'm also looking to see if you can bring uh, Rob Mora into the conversation if he's in the audience. Let's see if he's there. Yet. So I think we could certainly proceed without without um, Mr. Gold having, because he'll have an opportunity, I think, to speak a little bit. Um, are there some folks in the audience who are who, who are members of the Landlord Association and or are generally just um, either small, medium, large? Um, managers who would like to participate in some question and answer opportunity. I think uh, CRC members have expressed interest in at least asking some questions of you all. We're here to learn, we're here to understand what works or doesn't work. And that's very difficult with um, three minute responses to um, statements. 
So I see Renata Shepard, Tom Crossman, Pat Kamins, uh, Karen Quinn. I would like to ask if people know Karen Quinn. I do not personally. As, as um, someone who is a landlord, because I think that is the conversation tonight. Dave, are you comfortable with um, this is the this is the tough part to separate it out from just folks who would like to speak um, for you know up to three or four minutes and discuss what what works and doesn't work. Um, Are you looking for response from committee members, Pam, or? Yes. yes, I am. If there are other thoughts other than my own, Andy. So we have, what, seven people right now who've raised their hands. We could start by recognizing them in turn um, and, and then move on to potentially a conversation with some of them if they indicate um, if they are speaking on topic um, on this item and are a landlord in Amherst um, and potentially indicate their desire to continue the conversation beyond initial comments, you as chair could make a decision as to whether to allow them to remain able to talk versus not able to talk, but we could initially run it similar to a public comment. Um, I think that that could work. So I'm going to give a quick overview for those who have not attended meetings in the past on this topic. Um, and it it goes it looks back about ten years to uh, the so the my little bit of of prelude here. Back in around 2013, 2012, at the urging of many residents, the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Committee crafted the bylaw that's in place today. It was adopted by town meeting in 2013. It is voluntary and requests self-certification of safe living conditions. Since 2013, UMass has grown. It is now approximately 27,400 in-person students uh, housing on campus accommodates about 15,000 students. Those living in the Amherst area in the 01002 area number approximately 8,900 people. With this growth, there has also been a conversion of workforce housing that has converted into student housing and primarily as investment property. Many of the owners that own property in Amherst do not live in Amherst. The self-certification process by the owners and managers for habitable conditions has still uh, seen unsafe conditions that we heard about through our outreach and through our um, public forums that we held much of last year. The question is, and the question that has been raised often is, what does this proposal accomplish that existing bylaws or enforcement do not? And I think two points that the Community Resource Committee wanted to make is that self-certification of habitable conditions may not necessarily be protecting the health and safety of tenants. This proposed bylaw also allows consideration of other town bylaws in issuing a permit. So I, I, as that as a as a preface, um, I would like to hear from Renata Shepard to begin with Tom Crossman, Patrick Caymans, and um, and start that conversation if they have specific comments that they would like to make and then perhaps keep them available to speak. And we can make our way through uh, the list as was suggested. Um, it may be just a little less interactive than we 
imagine given what has happened tonight. I'm a little leery. So, Renata Shepard, please. State your name and address. Hi, uh, Renata Shepard from Justice Drive in Amherst. I'm a small landlord. Um, have a, a two bedroom condo that's uh, rented um, that we kept after we bought our house. And I have a small one bedroom condo in Northampton that's rented also that I've been in, you know, doing this for the past 25 years. Um, and the property in Amherst, uh, being a condo, it's very well regulated in terms of, you know, there there is a, a management company and there are rules and regulations. Um, and basically, I'm responsible for the inside of, of the condo. Just to give a background, if that's not uh, was not clear before, but um, let me uh, go back here. Um, I saw uh, Pam. I think you sent out something about um, there was a list of items and uh, number six. I, I have a big problem with that. It says the um, what was it. Linking permit renewal to tenant behavior provides Amherst Police Chief another option to gain compliance. I have a very big problem with that. Um, you know, the offender should be solely responsible. Uh, otherwise, you're treating tenants and landlords differently from owners. Owner residents should be held to the same standards. And, um, you know, raising behavior to like a criminal case or having police involved would help not only the landlords, but also the neighborhood, because then, you know, we have proof on our hands if we need to uh, try to evict or whatever. Because if you go the other way around, landlords, especially small landlords, have very little recourse. Um, we can't really, we can try to regulate behavior, but it's it, it's a lost cause uh, mainly. Um, and also, you know, you, you've heard a whole lot from me over the years, so I'm, I'm just going to summarize what I think of renter registration. It, it is cumbersome, intrusive, overreaching. It, you know, it's a blanket policy to attempt to solve about 10% of our issues. Um, if you must implement it, absolutely must implement it, uh, one initial inspection should be enough for safety and instructions and making sure the landlord know what they're doing. Um, Subsequent inspection should be complaint-driven uh, with the understanding that the complainant proves that they attempted to contact the landlord, be it a neighbor or whatever, because our information is on, on your site, um, or contact the police if the problem is tenant behavior. UMass should be involved if, ap if, if applicable, and the fees should not be higher than maybe $100 for non-owner occupied units or $3,000 per parcel if there's you know a large property especially landlords who rent out in, in condos like myself that have their own you know, set of standards and regulations. Um, with all the available technologies, there must be a way to save on personnel cost. Let's try to be creative and mindful of people's privacy and affordability. Thank you very much. You've been very, you've been very true to your um, to your word over the last couple of years, walking through this with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Tom Crossman. Uh, testing, can you hear me okay? Um, I wanna start off by apologizing uh, regarding the negative rhetoric that kicked off this meeting. That was very embarrassing. I wanna let you all know that you are all appreciated for what you do for our community. Um, it was it was a pretty uh, obscene uh, experience we all navigated. And I wanna make sure that you all understand that you are loved and appreciated for what you are doing. So um, moving forward uh, regarding um, the uh, rental registration bylaw topics, I just wanted to kind of go over a couple of quick things. Um, but before I dive into that, I did want to identify Michael Ercolini, uh, is a representative from the Amherst Landlords Association that we wanted to um, make sure that he had an opportunity to speak. Um, I believe he is in the audience. Uh, Michael Ercolini. Ercolini is spelled E-R-C-O-L-I-N-I. -I. Um, Thank you. Moving forward, 
moving forward, I just wanted to identify that uh, sometimes some of these uh, uh, statistics can be massaged a little bit. Um, for example, uh, the overview and purpose uh, since 2013, UMass has grown from uh, by seven or 8,000 students uh, to greater than 32,000. I'm looking at a letter that is to Amherst Town Council from UMass Community Relations dated October 25th that identified uh, five different time periods over the last five decades. And UMass in 1982 had a total enrollment of 24,939 with zero online students. In 2002 had 24,062 with 700 online students. And in 2022 had 32,229 students of which 4,523 students were online. Online students are completely online and do not attend classes on campus. So that ends up being a net 27,706 students. Uh, from 2012, the number was 28,236, of which 5,602 were online. So that is from 22,000 to 27,000 um, from 2012 to 2022 of which housing has increased on campus uh, from 2000. If you go to 2006, North Apartments were 864 beds added. And then uh, Commonwealth Honors College added 1,585 beds. Existing buildings uh, were modified to add 500 beds. University Village was 300 beds. And Fieldstone is 824 beds for a total of 4,073. Um, your overview and purpose says 850 units were built in the last 10 years. So some of those numbers and statistics that are provided may be a little misleading. And I just wanted to enhance and add information to make sure that there's more clarity as to what the numbers actually are. In addition to that, self-certification by owners, managers, habitable conditions uh, prior to the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods uh, Rental Permitting um, Procedure, uh, I think the numbers were roughly 480 nuisance, uh, noise complaints, and uh, violations uh, to the town. And then uh, as recently as 2018, 2019, the year's average 291 complaints. Uh, the Amherst Landlords Association asked for what those complaints were specifically to try to get more substantive information. And we uh, did not get any information back from uh, town hall. So um, those are those are just some of the things at the surface. I'm only touching part one of the overview and purpose and and just trying to highlight, you know, from our perspective, um, there has been improvement from the safe and healthy neighborhoods. Um, and the numbers, I, I will add, this was overlooked, but there has been an additional 1,100 full-time employees added to the university. So I was just referring to um, housing that was housing stock that was added to campus. There has been housing stock added to the community. There's been an absorption. It's very clear. And that's because uh, uh, Amherst is an employment nucleus and a lot of people want to live, work and play in the community. And so you can see one stuff is constructed. Um, there's immediate occupancy because of the high demand. Um, but anyway, that's just a little bit. I wanted to make sure that I yielded some of my time to Mr. Ercolini, um, who represents Amherst Landlords Association. Thank you. We'll get to Mr. Ercolini and we'll look for his hand up. Um, let's see. Patrick Kamen, please. Hello. Thank you for inviting me in. Um, I think I've met all of you, uh, except for the new counselor. Um, my name is Patrick Kamens. I run Kamens Real Estate. Uh, we manage about 1,500 properties in the area. We, I think I've spoken to each of the um, council people um, trying to help. And I was you know, invited by Mr. Zolmek to actually be on the original rendition of it um, many years ago. And I guess our concern as a group is we brought to the council um, questions of the legality of it. And, you know, I'm here to help if, if we can, if we can get an answer why we think it's legal and why we think we should be able to proceed. I'm, I'm really willing to help with you. I mean, I've done this for 32 years, but as I've mentioned, I mean, we really can't participate in something if our counselors are telling us it's illegal. Um, one of the big things that we have an issue with is when we wrote it, so many years ago, 
the fees had to equal the service and whatever service you want to call it. Um, and now I'm told that there's not a separate account. It goes into the general fund. There's a surplus of somewhere in the means of $250,000. So I guess our question is, not sure that's legal either. That's one of the points that we brought up and that we not had an answer to. Um, when I met with some of the counselors, they were very concerned to make sure that the fees did equal the costs. And I'm concerned for the last 10 years, what the owners I represent, where those surpluses have gone. And are we going to get those dollars back? And if there is surpluses, why wouldn't there be enough funds there to launch the program? There shouldn't be any additional fees. If there's, you know, say it's, if 250,000 is the right number, and I see Rob has joined us, um, he can add if he feels. But if 250 times 10 years, that's that, that, should, that should be plenty of money to get the thing rolling. So um, as a group, we are concerned of the legality of it. And I'd love to hear from the counselors. Um, what KP laws decided on that. Um, and if it's proven to us that, you know, it is perfectly legal, legal, then, you know, I'm willing to help you guys as I have in the past. Um, so I'll be happy to, I'm going to stay on here. I can add in if you have questions. Um, thank you for listening to me. And, you know, if you have any questions to me as someone that's done it for a while, I have, you know, small one unit rentals and I also have large communities that I rent. So I represent pretty much both sides of the spectrum. So I'm happy to help. Um, and thanks for allowing us to speak this evening. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, you definitely bring a lot of expertise to the conversation. So I really appreciate that. And we may come back to you with some of the questions. Um, I see a YZA. I do not know who YZA is. I'm willing to bring YZA in with a name and address. And um, let's go from there. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Yusuf Awad from Pine Street in Amherst. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'd like to make a short comment. Uh, my wife and I rent the house next to us and uh, we've been following this matter closely. There are some problems that we feel with the proposed regulations, but I'd like to point out one. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, okay great. Um, the nuisance property bylaw states that three infractions of the bylaw in one year results in, um, among other things, a loss of the residential rental permit. Uh, now we've had consistently have had wonderful conscientious tenants and have never had any complaint, but what if one year there is a tenant who gets three noise complaints and refuses to change their behavior. Why should we lose our right to rent overall for the criminal acts of another adult? Uh, I think the simple and logical solution to noise complaints would be to increase the penalties on the perpetrator, maybe uh, 300 first offense, 500 second, 1,000 third criminal penalties. These are adults who have broken uh, a regulation, a law, they should be held responsible because it can be very hard within the one within that one year period to change the behavior if you do unfortunately get a bad group of people which is very rare but it, it is possible that could happen um and i think that would do more to solve that problem thank you thank you sarah morton Name and address, please. Sarah, can you hear us? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Great. Um, Sarah Morton, I live on Eames Place in Amherst, and um, I have one apartment that I rent that's in my house. So, so very, very small <laughs> landlord. Um, I, I wanted to uh, say that, that it would be really great if you could make sure that you don't raise the price for for doing the the inspections and that you keep letting people self-inspect um 
I think it would be very intrusive to try and have to get someone in and um and I, I'm I'm also concerned about the the legality of what's being proposed. Um I, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I see Richard Gold. Thank you for, for being patient with us, Mr. Gold. Good, good evening. Um, I'm Richard Gold. I live on uh, Puffer Circle in North Amherst, a retired uh, UMass professor. Uh, with my wife, we've been uh, small time landlords in Amherst for uh, 30 years. We uh, lived through uh, the rental review board, which dragged us out at night for weeks. That finally went away. Uh, we occasionally have a problem and uh, the tenant calls the inspection services and uh, together we resolve the problem. That may be one out of 500 tenancies. Your plan to inspect all of the rentals in town seems like overreach, like it's a uh, solution uh, seeking a problem that there is no problem. This is just gonna cost a lot of money and you're gonna to have to hire more people and get more vehicles for them and have secretaries handling it and you're not gonna find much. So I don't understand why it's being done. Uh, perhaps uh, if you would inspect the, uh, the town manager's house and perhaps the uh, select board's people's houses, you'd also find occasional issues to correct. But that's not going to be done, and it's, it's not necessary. So I think it's a, a solution in search of a problem, and there is no problem. Uh, I suggest the, the, the current system, which is complaint-driven, works, and leave well enough alone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gold. I do see Michael Ercolini. I'm going to bring him in. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Michael Ercolini. I'm here on, on behalf of the uh, Landlords Association. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Um, I, I'm um, speaking because I've had a chance uh, over the last several months to review the bylaw and all its iterations uh, and its revisions. Um, and I'd like to speak just to the, the legality here uh, and look at those issues. Um, it, as it's defined under the current iteration of the bylaw, it's illegal both under the uh, United States Constitution and the Massachusetts Constitution. Um, and, and specifically, uh, the warrantless searches that it would permit um, I have been contrary to uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence for about 60 years now. Um, and just to spell out what the bylaw and its regulations in its current iteration would permit, it would permit the town inspector, which may be the, um, according to the regulations, the police chief of Amherst, if the town manager appoints him, to uh, conduct any time with any frequency inspections of private homes uh, in Amherst. Uh, and, and that's a concern uh, because I think what we need to do uh, as landlords uh, in, in the town is make sure that the complaints that we've heard are, or the response to the complaints is proportional to the problem. Um, and, and we're willing to do that to work with the town to, to, to see what those responses are. But uh, under the current uh, iteration of the bylaw, this would permit the, the town inspector, whomever he's designated, uh, to forcibly vacate uh, and secure entire properties within the town. I'm not sure if everyone realizes what's in the bylaw uh, currently, but that is what it would permit. 
And what we see as the major issue is that the town is going to be subject to um, tremendous litigation costs um, to deal with challenges to this because people in Amherst are not going to readily agree en masse to inspections of their private homes with any frequency that, um, that the town inspector uh, deems necessary. Um, so those litigation costs are going to be substantial. But on top of that, the damages are going to be far more substantial because in the event that the bylaw is held illegal, um, the town is potentially going to be on the hook for every month of lost rent uh, that is suffered by any property owner uh, in the town. Um, that includes also any consequential damages that uh, any tenant suffers as a result of their forcible eviction by the town inspector, which again is permis permitted under the bylaw. Uh, I, I can't stress enough, I think the best uh, route for the town uh, is to work with the landlords and um, from my experience in speaking with the landlords, they are open to solutions uh, that bring everybody together and uh, try to find a way to enforce the existing nuisance bylaw that's on the books, um, the registration bylaw that's on the books, and other laws that would be you know, subject um, to this registration bylaw that would effectively be enforced through it to increase the penalties as necessary so that we're holding responsible the, the actual actors instead of the town and mass and creating a, a pretty large bureaucracy that we think is unnecessary and disproportionate to the uh, to the problem that's presented by um, by the bylaw. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions on on the legality issue, um, but we've also circulated a memo uh, that spells out um, the Supreme Court jurisprudence, uh, some of the other cases. Um, right now, the bylaw would effectively coerce landlords in Massachusetts to agree to warrantless inspections of their tenants' private homes. Uh, as a as a means of renting property within the town, the application would itself re require the consent of the landlords to that. Um, and it, it's been, uh, you know, black letter law on the books for at least 60 years now that you cannot coerce the landlord to agree to a unconstitutional program uh, simply by applying to rent just to rent a property uh, in accordance with the zoning uh, and, and their rights uh, as landlords. So uh, I'm happy to address any of the specific, um, any specific questions that I uh, just raised maybe on the legality and, and point you to any case law, uh, but um, just wanted to raise those issues. Where's the chair? I was just going to say, did we lose our chair? <clears throat> I think we may need Miss Heineke to take over. Um, no, I think we need our vice, vice chair, chair Jennifer, Jennifer to take, to take over. over. Yeah, but did Pam lose? Or she'll come back on? We can, you could pause the meeting, Jennifer, well, until yeah, we no. try and figure out what happened to her. Sorry, I spoke to Heineke thinking that she was co-host. <laughs> Do I just want to ask, is Dave is still on? Mm. Dave. Yes, Dave is. Do you know, do we lose Pam for a moment? Yeah, Pam lost her connection. So she asked if the vice chair would take over, Jennifer. Okay, so I will go. I see um, Alan St. Hilaire is next from, you want to bring him in? So I, I'm here. I don't know if anybody can hear me. We could hear you if you could just uh, state your name and where the town you reside in. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan St. Hilaire. I'm the uh, owner of Valley Property Management in Amherst, Mass. And uh, I live in Hadley, but my business is in Amherst. Uh, so uh, I came to the meeting with a long list of things to talk about, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll touch on the high points and email the rest uh, for consideration. And some of them have already been covered. 
So uh, Tom Crossman had uh, helped to illustrate some of the data on the growth of the university. And I wanted to add to that, that in addition to the hard work that the Amherst landlords have committed to making Amherst a better community, along with the collaboration of the university and Amherst police, uh, UMass has increasingly become a better school with higher GPA requirements and higher caliber students. Uh, my son is 18 and applying to colleges. And I can tell you that uh, students won't even be considered without a 4.0 to the Eisenberg School of Management. Uh, it's a very, very competitive school with 66,000 applicants and 5,000 of those accepted. Uh, so my point is that the quality of students has increased immensely. Um, we get the police reports every Monday morning from Amherst Police Department, um, specifically for noise complaints or other behavioral issues on rental properties. And I've seen that sharply decline uh, in the 16 years that I've been in this business. Uh, every time we get those reports, there's only a handful of them. So I, I'm reiterating what some of uh, the attendees have already said that uh, we, we just don't see this as, as a big a problem as it's been made out to be. Um, beyond that, you know, a lot of our students are just good young adults. They're dog walkers, babysitters, snow shovelers. I've seen this in the rentals that we manage. We manage a lot of houses in sensitive neighborhoods. And uh, by and large, they're, they're good people. Uh, the, the other point that I wanted to touch on was, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, this recurrence of discussion of the self-certification uh, being insufficient. Um, but I feel that by no means is this the only method that the housing quality is upheld, or is it the best method, in my opinion? Um, any renter, whether it be a student or a janitor at UMass who's renting, uh, can call the Board of Health and make a complaint under the Chapter 2 State Sanitary Code that their minimum standards are not being upheld. And the penalties for this, uh, as a landlord, fall under the Mass General Law 93A, which allows for triple damages. So the tenants do have uh, quite a path of recourse if they uh, feel that their uh, housing does not meet minimum standards. So perhaps one aspect of the uh, things to be addressed here is educating these residents, students, non-students, grad students, workforce, and letting them know what their rights are. There was some attempt at this with including it in the leases, which it is, um, but much like UMass has done the, the uh, Walk This Way campaign, I think that there could be some education on what their rights are under the existing laws. Uh, and the last thing that I want to mention is the fee structure. Um, if this were to be implemented in some expanded manner from the present fee structure, it really needs to be proportionate to the property. Uh, it, is, it is outlandish to suggest that an owner that I manage a duplex for on Main Street should be paying half that of one of the larger complexes that have three, four, 500 units in town. Um, I do agree that the, there needs to be some sort of a budget to make this work. And then that budget is funded uh, from fees, but those fees need to be proportionate. If you're going to give a discount for a large property, uh, then that discount should extend to owners that have multiple properties or management companies that are responsible for multiple properties. Uh, it's no different in my mind than uh, we manage several properties within a half a mile on Main Street. Uh, seven or eight uh, multifamily properties. That's no different than Puffton where they have eight or 10 buildings in the same amount of space. Uh, so, you know, could the fees be proportionate to the number of units or to the tax assessed value, similar to how CPA funds are calculated? Um, you know, it needs to be uh, proportionate to the property. To say that Puffton or, or some of the other big complexes are capped at $1,000 is, is artificial. So... Um, thank you for the time. I appreciate your work on this. Uh, this is These are the things that I wanted to bring up uh, as most important. You're muted. You're 
Thank you, Mr. St. Hilaire. Those are some points that we've actually not heard from people much. Um, I apologize for my absence. Something just turned off and I, I was floating in space. I'm looking at the list of folks who have hands up. I see John Kinchla and Steve Walzak, Karen Quinn. Let's go with Karen Quinn, please. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I um I just wanted to say hello. I am new to um uh, managing an apartment building in Amherst. I'm um with Hampshire Property Management Group in Northampton. And um so this is the subject that has just come up. So I'm just um uh, interested to hear more and learn more through um council and what's happening with these um, regulations and rule and laws. So uh, it's very informational for me um, to participate in this meeting and I appreciate it and I really am <laughs> excuse me, enjoying hearing everybody's comments on this. So I look forward to hearing more because I think there's a lot of um conversation that needs to be had about this in terms of um uh, proportion and um and how everything's going to get allocated um so i just wanted to say hi and thanks to all of you for all that you do i know it's not easy and, uh, you know, we as property managers and property owners are trying to kind of navigate through this as well. So I look forward to hearing more about this as we go through this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to educate yourself. Uh, John Kinchela, please, if you could state your address. Hi, I'm John Kinchla. I live in Hadley and um, I rent out several um, mostly single family homes in Amherst. And um, I've spoken with Pam a few times about my thoughts on this program. And um, also want to say I appreciate that you guys are taking this up because as a landlord and a business owner in Amherst, I have seen the impact that um, uh, sort of unruly neighbors can have, let's say, on a neighborhood. And um, I recognize that it's an issue and definitely empathize with people who have to deal with that. However, so I think that what you're trying to do is good and necessary, um, but I view the bylaw as Besides the legal uh, concerns that are out there and are well documented at this point, I just view it as something that is missing the mark. Um, the previous drafts seem to place a lot of the burden on landlords. And it's been noted already that landlords actually don't have a whole lot of legal standing with their own property. Um, I'll tell you, I've tried to call the police on some of my tenants before who were having a loud, a loud large party. And they said, you can't do that. <laughs> so here I am as the property owner trying to do the right thing. And I actually can't inform the police of this. Somebody else has to do it. So consider that. That's where landlords stand in the hierarchy of things in the, in the um, legal world. Um, Alan St. Hilaire made a really good point, and I'll, I'll back him up on this. There's already a very effective mechanism for tenants to ensure that their um, living space is livable, and that's to order a Board of Health inspection. And trust me, nothing gets your attention quicker than when the Board of Health is at your property um, checking things over. It's 
it's a very high priority for most landlords. So there's a mechanism that already has a raft of regulations surrounding it that work quite well. Um, regarding the plans for this bylaw, the you know we live in a town that's focused on education, but I see very little of it in this discussion. Um, Alan also made a great point that these students are intelligent, they're motivated. Um, they're actually really, most of them are wonderful people and we're lucky to have them here in our community, um, but they don't know anything. This is for most of them, their first time living off campus, living away from home, and they simply don't know. So it took me a few years to sort of come to that realization because I'm just that much older than them. But then when I thought back to when I was their age, I realized I didn't know anything either, really. So we communicate with the, the tenants. We try to be very regular with our communications and proactive and reach out when, you know, there's nice weather coming and there's the tendency to go overboard with, um, with outdoor parties or there's cold weather coming or winter break is coming and, you know, they run the risk of people breaking, breaking into their homes if they don't lock them before they leave, things like that. And um, I think it would be really useful to consider the role of education and just creating a culture, an expectation that when you're living off campus and you're in a neighborhood, that's all well and good, but you have neighbors and you have families next to you. And it can't just be one or two communications sporadically. It has to be a regular occurrence and probably done by somebody who specializes in communications with college age students or college age people. And I think that type of investment would pay off well for the town. And the reason that I think that is because as Alan again pointed out, the um, incidences of noise complaints or nuisance complaints that Amherst police email to landlords every Monday has steadily declined. And to the point where now when you get the emails, sometimes even in the middle of October or, or um, a warm weekend in April or May, the noise complaints are way down. And I think a lot of that comes from the program that the police set up where, or UMass set up the, the party smart system where you can provide your information and, and indicate that you're intending to have a gathering and if it does get out of hand the police will call you up and inform you that you need to quiet down and i know my tenants use that i encourage them to use it i see it as a very positive tool that the town provides and the university provides and i'd really like to see more engagement in that fashion um, as opposed to this heavy-handed approach of um, we're going to have inspections. You must submit to its inspections. The fees will be submit substantially higher. And um, I really don't think that that approach is going to get the community what it wants to get, which is better quality of life. So I think one of the prior speakers indicated that they've requested information about um, inspections and, and safety um, problems and they haven't received that information from town hall that would be useful information if it was available but from what i hear and what my take on all of this is that the ultimate goal is to improve quality of life in amherst for the year-round residents and i don't see this program getting you to where you want to be and i think you need to have buy-in from landlords, students, the university, police department, fire department, people need to be working together to achieve that goal. So that said, I do think that things have started to move in the right direction. Um, I'll also say that the block parties that UMass has put on have been well received by my tenants. So um, yeah, I, education I really believe is the key here. And I would build my machine around that as opposed to uh, forced inspections and creating possibly more friction between 
landlords, tenants, and the community. So I, I thank you for allowing me a chance to speak and um, hopefully that's helpful information. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to go to Steve Walzak, please. Can you give us your address? Steve, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Steve, can you try speaking? I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Go ahead. We'll try to understand you. It's a little garbled. Steve Walsh, I don't think I'm in Massachusetts. Can you hear that? Very, it's very broken up. Try again. Is that any better? A little bit. A little, little bit better. People also like that. Do you want to let's let's um let's go to Cinda Jones and maybe and then come back to Steve. Steve, you may have the same problem I did. Just like I got unplugged. So can we do that? Can we go to Cinda, please, and then come back to Steve, thank you. Hi guys, thanks for having me. I live on Amity Street downtown and I have unruly student rental housing around me and I have unruly student rental houses that I am a landlord of in the Mill District North Amherst. It's hard to control student behavior and we do so many things to to do our best, we hire what I call mall cops. They're fake policemen who walk around and monitor the neighborhoods. We hire people to clean up on Sunday morning so there aren't red cups. We punish students when they misbehave. Uh, I hope there's a credit for doing as much as you can to stop bad behavior in the bylaw. I'm, I'm calling to ask us to think about the reasons why this came up. When I've lived here over 50 years off and on and downtown, and when people move here, it's shocking and hard to live between UMass and downtown. And when I moved back, it was shocking and hard because students live near the university. There are Goals said that are health, safety, and welfare, uh, providing clear expectations, enforcing bylaws, making rental houses safer. And those are true. But also, there's a contingency that's pretty vocal in town that wants it to be unhospitable to convert more houses to rental houses. And that's kind of behind the scenes one reason why this is happening to make it less profitable, less easy. And maybe maybe that's not the intent, but I think it's behind some of this. I would like us to consider that houses are not nuisances, that there are nuisance landlords and there are nuisance tenants and the bylaw needs to punish the nuisance landlords or tenants. Landlords change every few years, 70% of rentals, if they're student rentals, change every year. And we can't blame the house for, for the who's in it or who owns it. So if we agree that the problem is student behavior and unsafe houses, we should address these two things. And I think some of this bylaw goes beyond those two things. 
We need to stop allowing beer pong tables on front laws, make it illegal to encourage honking with signs like, you honk, we drink. We need to get the police to enforce underage drinking laws. I looked last year and I believe there were zero off-campus arrests. Change that. And we fix the problem of student behavior. Just enforcing the bylaws we have will fix student behavior. The unsafe houses, when there's a complaint you absolutely or you see on the outside it's unsafe it's pretty obvious when there's an unsafe house and i applaud your efforts to make this community safer and quieter thank you We lose Pam again. It looks like we lost okay. both Pam and Pat. Well, I'm going to call on Steve again. If Steve Walzak, your hands up. I'm trying again. I don't. Can you hear me? This is much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, Steve Walzak, Belchertown, Massachusetts, uh, Buffton Village, and the Amherst Landlords Association. Um, I have an awful lot to say about this, but I'm gonna just pick on two points that quickly hit me tonight. Uh, one thing that's been proven, if you study towns who have passed stricter registration laws, the actual number of people registering has gone down dramatically. And what ends up happening is inspectors spend all their time trying to get people just to register, not to comply. So I hope you take that into consideration and take a look around, uh, do some homework. Uh, it's the town recently in New Hampshire had this happen. The other thing is uh, I have a little contention about fees being higher for certain properties. I understand that the fee is based currently on the tax cost. The tax cost it could have one unit, it could have 500 units. On a poor time to issue me that permit for my tax cost, it's the exact same amount of work being done to issue the permit for the extended house. Fee and services are based on the actual service provided according to the law as I understand it. 200 units on the parcel, one unit on the parcel. We think that should be the attorneys. We have had our research. Basically, a lot of disagreements with the entire bylaw. I spoke to many of you separately about that. List of issues and the actual complaints we have not been We're having trouble hearing you now. Okay, is this any better? Now it's a little better. So really, I think issues should be provided to town residents some kind of study showing you know, what these issues are, where the complaints have come from, what are they made up of? Are they all noise complaints, knocking complaints? That justify a massive program? That's basically where, where I am at this point. I'd like to see a little more for this. Sorry, the sound has not been good. Okay, then I'm done. I can't hear you now. The big group. Steve, it makes <laughs> Now I'm being freeze up. Do you have, hold on. Pam, twice for some reason. You think because we have so many panelists, um, that's affecting the connection? Yeah, I got thrown out. I don't know what happened. I <laughs> Councillor Ethan has his hand up. Yeah. I... Um, 
I think first of all, um, Pat, I'm glad that you had thrown out, but you're safe and back. Um, but I would want to say for Steve or for anyone else who is having difficulties with connection, if it's possible to send an email so that we don't misrepresent what you may have said or what we might have um, missed in what you had. And that would also be helpful for those who are not or were not available during the time that you were speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dick. That is a very good point. Um, I'm trying to pull up the attendees list. So it looks as though I I would like to say that we have um, we have made our way through much of the commentary that uh, on this topic tonight, and we have a few minutes left. Um, I think there are, I want to give the opportunity to members of the council, the committee here, to ask questions of folks in the audience. And we can, if, if everyone could put their hands down in the audience, and if you'd like to respond to a question, that perhaps that uh, we can bring you back in to talk back and forth a little bit about a particular item or a particular question. And can people hear me because I feel like I'm in a time loop? Okay. <laughs> so uh, any questions from the council? I have a couple if you want me to go ahead, Mandy. Yeah, um, it's not really for anyone in particular, um, but the landlords seem to be extremely concerned about having their properties inspected outside of a self-inspection. Um, and we heard comments of that um, one comment was the beliefs, the ultimate goal is to improve the quality of life for year round residents. Um, we heard comments that, well, tenants can always just call the board of health. Um, yet when we did a survey of tenants, here are just a few of the comments that some tenants wrote about there are properties that presumably had a self-certification that all laws, board of health codes, building codes, and all of that were being followed. Um, cracks in a shower wall that no one will fix a problem, black mold, mouse infestation in the air ducts, cracked windows, holes in the walls to the outside. Not a thing was done about it. Homes infested with cockroaches and spiders. State law constantly ignored. Um, heat broken three times in a single winter and no sense of urgency to get it repaired. Smoke detector in a basement stairwell broken for one to two months despite constant messages to the landlord. Black mold spilling out of a crack in a bathroom wall. Mushrooms growing out of it. Two months, the maintenance, it took two months before a maintenance request was even responded to. The windows and doors don't close all the way. There is no installed heating source. Um, the went, rental has not had running water for three days straight. Um, a fear that if the residents file a complaint against their landlord, they will be retaliated against. So I want to ask the landlords, if residents fear retaliation, despite it being illegal to retaliate by calling the Board of Health, how would you write a bylaw to ensure that the regulations of the state health and safety regulations are being followed when it's clear from these comments that self-certification is not making that happen?
Would anyone like to speak up on that or reply? Tom Crossman has a hand up. And Pat Kamins and Steve Walzak. Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, I did. Um, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm kind of a data guy. And I do recognize that uh, there was a response um, from a survey that was provided for the general public. The response was 80 people, I believe 80 tenants responded. And if we take into consideration our community has 5,500 plus rentals and maybe on average three residents per rental, we're looking at over 15,000 uh, residents. And, and I don't feel that 80 people responding will be an adequate sample size of, uh, of how our town behaves. Um, I do, I do uh, uh, acknowledge that there are some bad players that are out there, um, but I don't think that that represents the majority. I mean, uh, a testimonial from 80 residents uh, out of 15,000 is less than 1%, so I don't think that's a large enough pool. Um, it, is, it is kind of heartbreaking to hear some of those conditions, and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, some of those conditions can get addressed as, as soon as possible, but... Um, I, I don't think that those uh, circumstance, those particular situations uh, represent how the housing stock is as a whole in the town of Amherst. So um, I do appreciate, you know, the gravity of the importance of those particular instances, but I, I don't think that's enough. Um, uh, I don't think that represents uh, all the housing stock in Amherst. Patrick or Steve? I'll take a stab at trying to help Mandy. So I agree with Tom that that's a small portion of the tenants. And I also believe that most of the people that are very happy with their housing aren't going to respond, right? I mean, if everything is perfect in their house, they're going to do nothing. They're not going to say, hey, my house is perfect. Everyone just expects the house to be perfect. But I think, I think what you're missing, unfortunately, is you don't have to rewrite a bylaw. The state has specific state regulations in place that every community in the commonwealth uses it's the same playing field same ideas same procedures same everything and i, I don't understand why because you're exactly right man there, there's no there's no retaliation we cannot retaliate if the board of health comes in we cannot retaliate we can't raise rent we can't evict them i mean i I've been doing it long enough that I've seen tenants that actually call the board of health when there's nothing wrong just to avoid eviction. They haven't paid month. They haven't paid six months rent and they call the board of health in so they can avoid eviction. So you're exactly right. There is, there's no way we retaliate. So the playing field is set for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I guess what the counselors are struggling is, or I guess what I'm struggling and why the counselors feel that Massachusetts has to have a higher standard than the rest of the communities in the entire Commonwealth. If the standards are set, that's the playing field. We all follow it. We all know we have to follow it. Not sure why Amherst has to be at a higher standard. So I, I, ho I hope that helps a little what your question was. And I'm, I'm happy to, if you have a rebuttal question, I'm happy to answer that as well. Thanks, Patrick. Sam, am I allowed to talk? Steve, yes, please. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar, and Rob should be. State sanitary code is just rewritten. One of the things that's going to be demanded in it, both funding and leases and in postings, is that people have to inform tenants of their rights to call the Board of Health. So some, something you're talking about is being addressed. It's being addressed on a statewide level as part of the state sanitary code, so we will have to adhere with that. Uh, so that is one thing that should alleviate some of tenants saying, well, we didn't know or we don't know, because it has to be made public. Where's that, Rob? Rob, can you hear me? Am I correct in, in my yeah. reading of that? Yes, that's correct. I, I agree with you, Steve. Okay. So that's just one point I want to make um, that, you know, will it make a dramatic difference? Not totally, because some tenants just don't call, but it will make a difference in some that are concerned. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we have several more hands up here. Um, I also want to let's let's keep that question going. But then also, Jennifer, do you have a different question that that people can respond to at the same in the same manner? I just wanted to respond to one of the comments about you know if we could target properties that are showing signs of deferred maintenance. And Rob may want to speak with this as well. But we were told that we. We can't do that. We can't knock the inspectors can't knock on the door of a house that looks like if it's show signs of delayed um, deferred maintenance or just looks dilapidated on the outside that that is does not allow the inspectors to go in because it's their sense that there's deferred maintenance on the interior as well. And that's one reason why how we arrived at the point of it being more systematic because we can't. That's the only way that in, you can inspect a house that one would assume based on how it looks on the outside um, is not up to health and is not code compliant on the inside. Is, is that correct, Rob? Yes, that's correct. If we if we were you know conducting visual inspections from the public way, saw things that appeared to be violations, we could attempt to contact the property owner and have those items deal, de, uh, dealt with, but it does not give us any, any reason to request entry into the house or to conduct a thorough comprehensive inspection under the state sanitary code that's been referenced here so many times. Um, it just wouldn't be appropriate to do that. Let's go to Renata Shepard. Jennifer, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'll go on Pam. I'll hold my comment. Um, Renata. Hi, Renata Shepard again from Justice Drive. Um, I loved what John Kinch was said about education. And if you, you cannot, yeah, you cannot just knock on a door just because it looks bad because maybe you have peeling paint on the outside, but it's great on the inside. Um, I think the idea would be really education. It works. Uh, if to avoid the appearance of impropriety of targeting the town has the means to inform every resident something should be sent to everybody in town you you have the emails you have a on call system you have the mailings that that go out we get a water report we, we get when you send something like this send a page something simple it doesn't have to be complicated it needs to be bullet points in maybe two or three different languages or with a qr code to translate in your preferred language or or whatever but so it can reach everybody it can reach cultures and in different languages and it would be something like number one if you're having if you're having a problem with your safety that is X, Y, and Z. Steps. First, contact your landlord. If you contact your landlord one or twice or three times or however many times and you don't get that repaired or replaced or fixed, the next step is call the Board of Health. And that's where, I guess, the town, not only the Board of Health, but you know the, the inspectors or whatever would be engaged in answering to that complaint explain that they cannot be retaliated against for doing that because housing court is very favorable to tenants um, as everybody in this panel probably knows. <laughs> and um, it, it does not have to be heavy handed, complicated. It needs to be educational and it needs to reach everybody. And it, it, it will lead to punishment if things are not done but you need something simple, a one page with an explanation and saying that they won't be retaliated against because it's against the law and that they can reach that information in their language of choice. I'm a translator, so <laughs> I guess that kind of comes naturally. Um, I don't know, how about that? And, and that doesn't cost that much. Excellent idea. 
Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, thank you. I thought, uh, I believe there were uh, references to tenants' rights and education, uh, providing them with information, the landlord providing them with educational information about what to do, where to complain, et cetera. I believe that's in the rental registration bylaw. The other thing is I want to say to Ms. Shepard, uh, I agree with you with the discomfort uh, that you have around item number six, where um, you can lose a permit because of student behavior. So you're not alone in that concern. But I am still concerned, irrespective of how small the percentage of respondents were, uh, because as a counselor, I've received outside of that survey complaints from tenants. Uh, we have had in Amherst um, mid-lease rent increases. We have had affordable units receiving mid-lease uh, rent increases. And luckily, the tenant involved was able to confront the landlords and get that um, taken away. But we don't know uh, about the other affordable units, whether that was true for them or not. We have a young woman who at the end of her lease period was denied her security deposit by a management company here in Amherst because there was something wrong with her kitchen. And the photograph that they used to prove that there was something wrong in her kitchen was a different kitchen. It was not hers. It was a manipulation by the management company. Um, so we're getting complaints from tenants. We have had countless students in, in casual conversations talk about the threats that they get from landlords. Um, if, or if the landlord says, if this doesn't work, I've, I've tried to deal with this mold twice. If this doesn't work, you know, then forget it. I'm not going to do it. Then I'm not going to do anything else. So to downplay renters' complaints makes me very uncomfortable. Um, we, it is not a system where a tenant who is threatened feels safe to call or contact. And the education piece is absolutely important. Uh, but we need to really look at what's needed. It Complaint-driven inspections don't necessarily work. And self-certification does not work. I wouldn't want to have people self-certify their ability to drive a car. So we need to find a way to compromise on some of this instead of just threatening lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Pat. I'm going to add a question. Uh, Jennifer, you had your hand up earlier, but if you wanted to repeat it. Um, one of my questions that um, has struck me a number of times is I, I've heard from now a number of places that, that it would be illegal to require uh, a, a mandate an inspection. And yet in speaking to some of the landlords here, we, you know, they, they told us that they in fact do their own annual inspections. So it's, it, it can't be the inspection itself that's that's illegal because it's already occurring on their own on their own time and in their own manner um, and and reaching out to their tenants in whatever fashion that they do. So um, it it keeps striking me as as um, not based in not based in in actual occurrence. Um, and I, I wouldn't mind hearing from a couple of folks. Um, on that topic and also on the education. So I'll follow up to the two folks that have talked about education, just given the number of, um, I think it, when, we, when we think of, when I, excuse me, I'll just use myself. When I think of a long-term resident, resident or uh, someone who is working uh, at a job uh, and lives in the community, hopefully for them, they get to live and work in that, work at that job for a couple of years. So reaching out with, some information, perhaps on an annual basis might help, but when we have the, uh, we have to determine the actual number of off-campus students, but from that latest information, roughly 8,900 students live in the 01002 area. That is, that is a group that, that literally 
moves and transitions every two and three years from place to place. So um, seeking help on and working on education of that particular population um, would be extremely helpful. So I'm gonna call on Michael Ercolini again, and then Mr. St. Hilaire to respond to any of any of those questions. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to respond to the previous point first. I, aside from the anecdotal uh, uh, instances of complaints from, from students, just by the numbers, um, you're talking about 80 complaints uh, out of about 5,500 rentals, I believe it is, which is less than 1%. Um, and you're effectively, you're per suggesting a program that would cover 100% of cases in order to target 1%, which is, you know, by any stretch is, is, uh, is going to be ineffective in just targeting those instances where you have a problem. Um, you're going to be far less effective in doing it, in fact, because you're trying to hit all 100% of the units in town. Um, as far as the other instances go that, that you've, you've said that there's been a change uh, mid-lease of the rent and increase, there's been a refusal to return the security deposit, and, and a lot of the other issues that you've raised about habitability, those are all covered by Massachusetts law. Um, I, neither of those practices is permissible under Massachusetts law, which would be an issue for housing court. Um, you cannot change uh, a, a rent, uh, the rent mid lease. You cannot demand uh, more than the security deposit and the first month's rent. Um, and you cannot refuse to withhold, you cannot withhold a, a security deposit at the end of a lease unreasonably. Uh, that's an issue that I assume that the, that the board is not trying to preempt Massachusetts law on. Um, uh, in addition, the, the habitability issues that you've raised about mold, all of those things are um, part of the warranty of habitability. There's a warranty of quiet enjoyment, which every tenant in Massachusetts is entitled to. And if uh, a landlord is not fulfilling their duties on that, a, 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 a tenant is within their rights to withhold rent for refusal to do so. Uh, and that's going to be an issue for housing court to determine. And I, again, would stress that, that I don't think the board is trying to preempt Massachusetts law on those issues. Um, as far as the, the inspections go, uh, the, the, the difference between an inspection by the, by the landlord, and, and I will just note that a lot of these landlords are subject to federal regulations, and they're regularly inspected by HUD, uh, by, other, uh, by other bodies, and they receive a federal grade. And, and many of these properties uh, receive 90 and above uh, for their units, and and there's no discretion. Well, there's there's discretion now on on those inspections. Whether uh, if you if you pass a HUD inspection, now the board has uh, the the uh, inspector now has the discretion to decide whether you're subject to the the uh, the bylaw. It didn't used to be that way in 2013. If you passed your federal regulation, you were fine. Um, and uh, so again, I hope we're not trying to preempt those laws. But the difference between a municipal inspection and an inspection uh, by the landlord themselves, uh, it's a big difference because you can do those during a vacancy, vacancy if you're a landlord. If it's a municipality doing it and they're telling you that they're going to show up 20, within 24 hours and you really don't have uh, the, the ability to refuse to consent except you can, you can sign a, um, a declaration and a sworn affidavit that you're refusing to consent which most people are going to be loath to do. There's a big difference between those two. The municipality has different different uh, different abilities with respect to the property as the landlords do, and the landlords can opt to do it during a vacancy. Uh, they have a lot more flexibility to do so. So um, that's what I'd say about that. If you have any other questions, happy to answer them. Uh, Alan St. Hilaire, please. And then we, I think, I, I'm looking at my watch. It's it's past 8.30, and I think this is a good place to end. So I'd like to hear from Mr. St. Hilaire, please. Thanks very much, uh, Ms. Chair. Uh, one quick thing I wanted to touch on that's a little bit off topic, but relevant to the first thing that was brought up. The very first bullet point under the overview and purpose mentions that the current uh, rental registration bylaw is voluntary. My understanding is that is not true. Um, when that first came out in 2013, the building commissioner and his inspectors were writing letters to any and all property owners in Amherst that did not have their mailing address at the property demanding they comply with the rental registration. And we also get 
yearly renewal notifications that it's time to pay the fee and renew online. So I just wanted to uh, illustrate the fact that that is in fact very much mandatory. Um, jumping back to Ms. Henneke's question, uh, it's unfortunate that the survey for the CRC committee was the way these issues were brought to light by the tenants. Uh, and I do think this uh, reflects back to the need for education, both of the tenants and of the landlords. Um, there was a, a point made earlier that small landlords um, may not uh, have the tools or the education available to them. And I do believe that that needs to take place. Um, if they don't have the experience, if they bought a property and were given the set of keys, they don't understand management. They may not understand mass law. They may not understand the sanitary code. They may not understand uh, the legal rights, security deposit law, et cetera. So perhaps um, along the same vein of education, something could be made available and, and required as part of the, either the current bylaw or any proposed revision is that first time landlords uh, pass some sort of an online education that just gives them, an, and I think this, uh, is also reverberating what Renata said. Um, you know, a few bullet points. This is what you need to do. This is what the laws are. This is what you need to tell your tenants. This is what you can and can't do. And if you need more information, here's some links to all of that material. Um, as property managers and rental agents, we have state mandated licensing qualifications and continuing education requirements to do that. So there should be some requirement for the small landlords and perhaps some of the, the uh, less educated and underperforming landlords to have that information available to them. One other thing I just wanna put out there is in addition to uh, access to all the laws uh, that the council mentioned, um, the UMass students have access to free legal representation through UMass Legal Services. So that is another way of uh, they can protect themselves from retaliation, from improper handling of security deposits, from violations of state laws, whether it be safe and healthy living or uh, financial through their security deposit rents, et cetera. Thanks very much for allowing me this additional time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I see John Kinslow's hand. Did you have any final words? Um, not sure if you're trying to get in. Um, we've had a really good discussion tonight. I think I have learned some things um, and I appreciate the time that everyone has put into this. I, again, am completely um, disappointed in the, in the activity at the beginning of the meeting and I will give some thought as chair to how on earth we can try to prevent that kind of activity from ever occurring again. I think at this point, it, we have covered our items. Our, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm gonna wrap up the action items. Uh, we've done minutes. Are there any announcements? Next agenda preview. The two items that we had on the as a as a a rough um, target anyway were nuisance bylaw and solar bylaw, and right now we do not have any information on solar oh, bylaw. Let me just bring this down a little bit. Was that John Kinchel is trying to speak? I think we just cut it off. John. Hi, sorry. I don't know how to run this thing. <laughs> uh, I'll let you finish up the meeting and I can put my comments in a written form. That would be appreciated. And actually, thank you for actually, thank you for that note. I was going to say, if people have other comments that they would like to send to us, please do. They can send it to each of us as counselors. They can send it to um, myself as the chair and it will be distributed. Um, but really appreciate all the time and energy and focus for folks tonight. Thanks. So, um, and you could just move John Kinchla back into the audience. Um, 
So next next agenda preview, the items that we have, nuisance bylaw and solar bylaw. I haven't received anything on the solar bylaw yet uh, in terms of beyond waiting to actually get a chance to talk to staff and find out if there's a, um, a method to madness to kind of work through all of the departments that the uh, CRC is tasked with meeting with and getting input from. Um, sounds like we need to put ZBA on the agenda again because we would like to make some progress on that. Anything else? And the this the rental bylaw will that and rental bylaw of course yep yeah Mandy has her hand raised or did I can't see it hmm. Mandy you have your hand up Jennifer covered it okay thank you thanks Pat um I have no items that were not anticipated 28 hours in advance. I would like to adjourn the meeting. It is 8.43 and I'm sorry we went over the 8.30 mark. We'll try to uh, keep it within the two hours in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.